large scale destruction of the merchant fleet, causing not only great loss of life, but also a fear that the British population would become, well, would be fatally starved because of lack of materials and food. Um, at one stage, they only had what I found six weeks supply of food left, but according to BBC Scotland's story, um, War at Sea, um, there was only two weeks. So it was pretty, pretty important that they found a method of de detecting U-boats. Um, Cyril Ryan, who was an uh, Irish naval personnel, had become very interested in radio waves and he had left the Navy to work with Marconi, but he had invented a hydrophone and so he was called back at the beginning of the First World War. A hydrophone is... Um, an underwater microphone receiver. It has a microphone receiver in a waterproof capsule, looks a bit like a bedpan, with a diaphragm round the receiver. And when um, the pressure changed in the capsule due to a sound wave hitting it, it would send um, a electrical signal down the cable which was attached to the microphone receiver and this could be picked up by a trained ear and this is this is as far as Cyril Ryan had got with this but it did work and he was able to pick up noises um, from various boats uh, underwater using this method. Uh, the first boat that they had attached to the base was called HMS Tarlayer. And looking for a name for the base, they decided that this would be a good name for the base. So this was a drifter, HMS Tarlayer. That was the, the captain and the crew. This is a Hawk Craig Point where they decided um, Cyril Ryan went to the Navy with his hydrophone and in particular um, Captain Admiral Beatty was very interested in the experiments and he lived in Abadar House that you can just see at the top of that slide there. Um, at the bottom of the slide you can see the base and there's a hotel there. I don't know if anybody's been to room with a view. Silver Sands is on one side and Aberdeer Harper's on the other side. So it was a peninsula that could be easily cordoned off. There also was a deep water channel for experiments. Um, and it was uh, protected by an anti-submarine boom defence system. First of all, Admiral Beatty's experiments, he carried them out in Granton, but Admiral Beatty decided that Aberdeer was a much better place to carry them out. We're very lucky to have all these pictures that I'm going to show you tonight. Most of them are from the, um, are from the, the Maritime Museum down in London. Um, they're Cyril Ryan's own pictures, and he... He donated them when he died. There's some other pictures I got from somebody called Stevens that worked on the base and one or two others. But was very lucky to get all these pictures. This is Cyril Ryan and he's actually standing outside his house, which just so happens to be my house here in Aberdeer. And he took pictures of this and obviously in the snow, probably a day like today. And, um, <laughs> and of course I've improved the house a wee bit since he had it ha ha but uh, that was I just couldn't believe it when I started studying to discover that he lived in the same house that I now own and live in. Um, there's not much left of the base now if you were to go to Aberdeer to look for this wonderful base this is a harbour that was built for the base and that's a remote control 
torpedo, which um, which was one of the experiments that I'll discuss later on. This is a picture looking up Hawk Creek as it is now at the top and as it was then at the bottom. This is one looking over to Burnt Island with all the huts. Of course, there's no huts there now. And that's one. There was a seaplane base at Hawk Creek as well. There's not much left of it, but you can see roughly where it had been. This is the the site in 1915 where they, when they took it over, there had been a quarry at Hawk Creek and that was what was left over from, from the quarry. Now, HMS Talair was the Navy's main hydrophone research and training base throughout the World War I and a total of 4,000 officers and ratings were trained at the site as well as um, the training they had to have workshops to make the hydrophones they had um, laboratories to to experiment to make uh, the hydrophone to perfect the hydrophones and they had um, training facilities to train the people uh, all everybody who worked at the site had to sign the Official Secrecies Act. And um, so local people who worked there never even spoke about what they were doing. Um, so nobody was aware of, of this base being there after the end of World War I. I grew up in Aberdeer and I had no idea of the base and neither did any of my contemporaries. So in this picture, you can see quite a lot of the Royal Navy Reserve. And in the middle there, um, holding dog, dogs, three dogs in the middle, um, is Captain Ryan. The dogs were all over the place uh, during the working day. Um, one was a, a sea cocker spaniel, um, and it was very deaf. And when they were setting off explosions to build the pier, this dog went over to the um, explosion, well, over to the fuse and started to sniff it. And everybody was shouting at it and they were throwing stones to try and get it to move away. But th thankfully, the, the fuse um, didn't go off and the dog lived to see another day. One of the other dogs was very interested in his food and was always stealing his sandwiches. So he set up an electric shock for that, both for his sandwich one lunchtime. And when the dog went to grab the sandwich, it rang out the door at top speed and never did it again. And one of the other dogs liked to chase the sheep. And one day a farmer shot the the dog and it was a, presumed he was dead but a couple of days later the dog arrived all bedraggled at his house and he'd lived <laughs> to survive another day so that in most pictures you can see the dogs um floating about um these are exper um pictures of of the huts and you can see I can't see any dogs in that one, but you can see the base was beginning to to establish itself and more huts were being built. Now, Cyril Ryan had built the hydrophone and he was, but what they needed to, they needed the top scientists of the day to perfect the hydrophone so that they could, the hydrophone will pick up a noise, they'll need to know what the engine noise was from, was it from you know, a motorboat or was it from a U-boat? And so they had to detect the frequency and also the position of where the noise was coming from, the, the engine noise was coming from. So this was um, how the scientists joined the establishment here. It was a naval establish, establishment to start off with and um, then civilian scientists joined. And this is one of the first scientists. This is Albert Wood. And I got quite a lot of the stories from his memoirs. 
he had an honours degree in physics and he worked under Professor Ernest Rutherford, who was allegedly the top scientists of the day. And they worked for the Admiralty Board of Invention and Research. Um, he was particularly interested in um, the detection and location of submarines. And so Professor um, Rutherford thought this would be much more down his street than learning to fly. One of the other scientists that they brought along was a Harold Gerard, who was an electrical engineer. Um, and these scientists began to work together and they were given the remarkable salary of a pound a day. This was the first time civilian and naval scientists worked together. Um, they brought in Sir Richard Pageant, who was a famous musician at the time, and he appeared with a Mr. Gordon who was totally blind but had absolute pitch, so that was really important. Um, and they reckoned that Mr. that um, they would be able to detect the direction of sound using um, Mr. Gordon and uh, Richard Paget had this amazing idea that if he hit his head um, he could produce a G sharp and so um, they took a boat out and they had the, the submarine that was attached to the boat, the base, go round and somebody held on to Richard Paget's feet and he put his head underwater and he came up several times and he was able to establish the frequency of the submarine. But although that was quite an interesting project, it was never going to be one that the Navy was going to practice. And they were just all pleased that he didn't actually catch pneumonia. Now, they brought in musicians to um, the experiments as well, obviously, because they reckoned that they had um, better um, sound properties than most people. Um, so this was Hamilton. Hamilton Harty, who was the conductor of the Haley Orchestra. He and his wife, Agnes, were brought in. And they sat to sit amongst a pile of hydrophones. They had worked out that um, if they adjusted the diaphragms of the hydrophones in such a way, when they hit the hydrophone with a hammer, it would pick up high sounds or it would pick up lower sounds. So they sat all day amongst all these hydrophones, um, hitting it, hitting them with a hammer and putting them into the various piles of high and low. They were then fitted onto the boat, the, the port for the low sounds and starboard for the high to pick up the high frequencies. And together to a listening ear, to a trained ear, they were able to um, establish the direction of the boat. There's a, another of Cyril Ryan's out with another dog, his dogs. Now, out in the bay here, you can see the boats. There was 12 boats attached to the base. Um, one was called, well, they had the submarine and they had um, a patrol boat and a trawler and a destroyer. But they had this other boat, see them there? And it was called Niker. And Niker stood for no yachting knowledge required. And Niker was the first remote control boat. They were able to adjust the steering and the speed from the land, or in this case, from the seaplane um, in the remote control experiments. And this, of course, went on to produce the first remote control torpedo 
there, and that's a Lieutenant Black with the remote control torpedo. Um, so they had the single um, hydrophone that I showed you at the beginning that, that Captain Ryan had produced. They went on to produce this one, which is a bi-directional hydrophone, and it could pick up, obviously, sound from two directions at the same time. And they went on to produce a multi-directional hydrophone, and that's it there. Now, as soon as with the experiments with the submarine that they had attached to the base, as soon as they were able to pick up the submarine at four miles, all the Allied naval and merchant ships were given this, these hydrophone packs and they were all um, trained how to use the hydrophones and it saved such a lot of lives. It was really good. Um, so there they are experimenting with the hydrophones on the drifter. And then along came Professor Bragg. He had um, won the Nobel Prize for his work with X-ray crystals and structure. And he came to Hawkeye to work on the unidirectional hydrophone. And this is a, a picture of Admiral Beatty, who of course lived in Aberdeen and was Admiral of the Fleet, fleet along at Versailles. Um, he often came down with his wife and son and viewed their experiments. And they often brought people with them, like Princess Prince Prince Louis of Battenberg and the Duke of Bakou came along. Uh, when I was talking to one of the older citizens who was alive at the time, he William Cuttle, he remembered Admiral Beatty taking people from Abadar out in his own personal boat, the Lion. Um, a small steamboat, and they went to St Andrews for the day, and he paid for their um, tea. And also, his wife gave money towards the institute in Aberdeen to make it more um, more comfy for the soldiers, especially the ones from Inchcombe that came over and maybe wanted to spend the night providing hammocks and things for them. Now. Professor Bragg became, in May 1916, the resident director of research. Of course, they all worked with Cyril Ryan, not, uh, he wasn't um, over Cyril Ryan. These, he was director of research, but they were civilians. And along with them came several other scientists and professors from Australia, for instance, uh, Professor Hopwood and a whole list of other professors came to work on the base, including scientists that I remember, mostly Darwin and Geiger. And they all came to Hawk Craig, not all at the same time, but they all came to contribute towards the experiments. This is a picture of one of the workshops and the hydrophone cables, you can see. And there's the, one of the classrooms with them learning the physics behind the hydrophone. Now, in June 1916, they were devastated, the men working at um, HMS Talia because they heard that some of Admiral Beatty and Admiral Jellicoe, who had been at Hot Creek two weeks previously, fine ships had been sunk, and a large number of men had been lost in the Battle of Jutland. They witnessed the stragglers returning to Rosyth shortly afterwards. On the 6th, 17th of June, 1916, King George V, 
visited Admiral Beatty at Abadar House, where Admiral Beatty lived. Um, and he visited the experimental base and viewed some of the experiments from, I was told, especially glass made tower overlooking the bay, which I think that one must be. The previous day, um, Mr. Asquith, the Prime Minister, had visited Versailles. These events impressed on the staff at Hawk Creek more than ever before the very important contribution their research was making to the war effort. Um, HMS Talier at Hawk Creek from 1915 was the Navy's major landmark in development and scientific research. Now, there were other people who came forward with methods of detecting submarines. One of them was the Seagull proposals. This was a Thomas Milne who, his proposal of using seagulls to identify the presence of new boats. And his trials were commissioned in 1917. These trials involved towing a dummy periscope uh, from which food was, was discharged. Hopefully that the spare periscopes would be spotted by seagulls and they would swarm to get the food. Um, this is a periscope from a submarine copied from one of their experiments that was used on coast. Um, now, Admiral Beatty wasn't keen on this experiment at all. He thought this was daft and he wouldn't allow them to use the submarine. And Thomas Mill complained to Admiral Beatty that he wasn't getting cooperation from Cyril Ryan. And Admiral Beatty said, well, if it's inconvenient for Cyril Ryan, then you know it's up to him. And it obviously was inconvenient because there was no records of it ever being used. The whole thing was, uh, the whole experiment was, <laughs> was hopefully put to bed until it was unearthed by Coast, who thought it would be a good idea to um, carry out this, this experiment. So that was the deek, the... Yeah, there, we go. Now, there was also an airplane base, a small seaplane base at Hawk Craig in the garden of the Fourth View Hotel. It was actually in operation before the First World War from 1913 to 1919 anyway. And it had a single aircraft hangar and one listening hut. Um, there's not much remaining of it now, but you can just make out where the, the runway was. Seaplanes were used to spot U-boats and keep them, keep an eye on them. Uh, and therefore, U-boats would, if they spotted a seaplane, would remain under water longer and become more vulnerable. That's the chap that was in charge of the seaplanes, the major they called them. That one shouldn't have really been there. That's um, one of the seaplanes being launched. There's quite good descriptions of the seaplanes being launched with people um, hanging off the wings to try and keep them parallel if it was windy and, you know, one, <laughs> one of these people got to uh, Injured, the hand got injured. That's another one of the seaplane base. Another one of them launching it. Anyway, at, at the start of the Battle of Jutland, Admiral Beatty ordered the launch of the seaplane. Um, it was heavy clouds that day and it had to fly beneath the clouds. Um, therefore, it was easily spotted by four enemy battleships <laughs> and they open fire but they fail to hit it um, and 
the chap who, the pilot of the plane was called Rutland. And after that day, he was called Rutland of Chutland. He got back safely, obviously, but um, Beatty was to write that it indicated that seaplanes under su such circumstances were of distinct value because the seaplane did spot the enemy um, battleships, even although they, they also spotted him. Um, however, they went on to arm the seaplanes and they were quite successful then in sinking um, U-boats. Uh, at least three were sunk in May 1917, but um, there were actually a lot more. This is um, the aircraft carrier Pegasus, and you can see just off, off it uh, where the seaplane is, and they had a, a crane type thing to lift it back. It obviously didn't land on the aircraft carrier. Um, these are men training to use the hydrophones. Um, they had, as well as having the hydrophones on all the Allied boats by this time, they also had listening huts all around the coast of the British Isles, Ireland and the Mediterranean. Um, all these hydrophone stations and the hydrophones on the boat on the boats all came under um Hawk Craig um, and HMS Talia. Um, the listening huts had eight to sixteen insulated cables from a distance from two to ten miles and they were put on tripods resting on the seabed. Uh, they were they had a limitation of 10 miles away from the hut, but they were able to, to detect boats. That's the tripod. And unfortunately, the picture that was about here somewhere, there's the other tripods there. Picture up from here. So we'll go back to here. So... Um, in the, a German book called The U-Boat the U -boat War, um, the Lizard Hydrophone Division picked up a German minesweeper called UC-66 and it passed over one of these hydrophones and a depth charge attack detonated the cargo that they U boat was the German mine layer was laying, and apparently the sea boiled afterwards. Um, and the German newspaper wrote that science bode ill for the U boats in the future. The hydrophone science bode ill for U boats in the future. So, um, that was the first real notice that they had taken of it. Um, this, they also invented the hydrophone mines. Um, that was a, magna, a magnetophone placed in a mine with a detonator and a firing circuit. And the magnetophone, which is like a hydrophone, was activated by sound waves. Um, and it produced a small current which was set back to the sent back to the listening station, but it had a range of only two hundred yards. But it went on to sink at least three U boats, but we're finding out it was a lot more. Um, and it was um, it was there in Scapa Flow in October. 1918, that the last U boat was sunk at Scapa Flow, going over one of these magnetophones. Now, some of the other ex ex experiments, because they had all the top scientists of the day here, 
they um they started to work on other scientific experiments and this was an extremely interesting one i think um professor alexander rankin he um he produced a method of um projecting sound using light waves it uh, he had a transmitting mirror at Hawk Creek in Aberdour and a receiving mirror at Inchcombe, which is one and a half miles away. And the photophone, which was the device that he, he had perfected, um, was designed for short range communication between ships. But um, it was never used as this because it was really difficult to line up the um, the modulated light beam. So basically, um, there was a small concave mirror attached to a gramophone sound box or telephone ear earpiece, um, and it focused the light from a point source onto a similar system on the inch comb, um, trying to make it simple. <laughs> but when the, the two were set up, the receiver was able to hear the sound very clearly through those headphones. Um, it was easily audible and a very good quality. There's the distance from Hot Craig to Inchcomb. Now they borrowed some hydrophone cable from Cyril Ryan um, to make it easier to, um, to project the light beam from one side to the other over the mile and a half. Professor Bragg had managed to persuade Captain Ryan to lend him the hydrophone cable, but when Professor Bragg went back to London, <laughs> Captain Ryan ordered the cable to be taken away. Now, Captain Ryan was very cynical about the civilian scientists thinking that they would make money from these experiments at the, at the end of the war. But this experiment went on to produce the te technique went on to produce the first talking movies and that was um, patented by um, by Professor Rankin and Cyril Ryan. So there you go. <laughs> now these are some interesting pictures that we came across. Um, of Cyril Ryan's. He's got all the huts marked, hut three, uh, all the different workshops. Quite interesting at Hot Craig there. And this is another picture of them practicing with the hydrophones. Because they were working with sound underwater, they discovered that the velocity of sound was four and a half times faster underwater than in the air. And that was uh, something that hadn't been noticed before. That was a way that they were able to pick up. Eventually, the U-boats at 12 miles away. And they carried on with the development from the hydrophones to a fish type hydrophone called the eel and the most advanced one was the porpoise which was remote controlled so it wasn't affected by the noise of the engine of the boat that it was in and it was in a streamlined capsule and here's some pictures of them Here's a nice picture of the captain of uh, HMS Tarlier along with 
the major from the seaplane base having a, a chat. <laughs> um, these are some of the local men who worked at HMS Tarlayer. I remember one in particular, Dougie McLaughlin. Never mentioned this, of course, when we were young. Um, the next experiment, which I didn't know about when I wrote the first edition, is um, Dr. Crichton Mitchell and the indicator loop trials. Dr. Crichton was a research fellow from Edinburgh and he had been doing research on conductivity um, and the changes in the Earth's magnitude, which would produce an electric current in a loop of wire. So he went out to Inchkeith with Cyril Ryan with um, a loop of uh, hydrophone cable, and they tried these experiments using this indicator loop, basically loop. Basically, if a boat went over the top of this loop of wire when it was horizontal on the base of the sea, it would produce a current which could be easily picked up. Um, to start off with, they were also picking up electrical interference from leaf from the trams. And then they discovered that they, they twisted the wire into a loop or into a figure of eight, the indicator loop, as it was called, um, that would prevent that interference. This was kind of shelved a bit in the First World War. Um, but uh, they went on to have indicator loops at every harbour in Britain and every at the beginning of en every estuary in Britain um, in the Second World War. And this is one, I actually got this picture from Burnt Island um, Museum um, and it just gives you an indication and that these were on Inch Keith in the Second World War where they could listen for enemy boats. So it was invented at Hot Creek in the First World War and used extensively in the Second World War. Um, the Museum of Communication in Burnt Island also replicated the photophone, Professor Rankin's photophone, and it's um, you can you can go along when the museum's open and uh, and watch it working. It's quite fascinating. These are possibly experiments with the indicator loops. Now this is another. <laughs> this is uh, another um, invention at Hawk Creek, of course. Uh, William Cuttle, the chap that I mentioned earlier, his earliest memories of visiting Hawk Creek Cottage, which is where I live, um, and where Captain Ryan lived in the First World War. Um, he would accompany his mum, who often came along here to see Captain Ryan's housekeeper because she um, was popular with the women folk of the village and um, because she read tea leaves. So Captain, so William Cuttle would accompany his mum and if Captain Ryan was here, he would take him into his living room, which I'm in now, the very same room, and he would press a button and this remote control toy dog would run out of this toy kennel round the room and back into the kennel again, much to William Cuttle's delight. Um, and that was probably one of the first remote control toys. Um, and it was invented here and Cyril Ryan patented it at the end of the war. Now, they had some quite famous people here. This is Paderewski, who was a famous um, pianist in the First World War. Because they had um, uh, 
Paget here in the First World War um, doing the experiments with sound underwater, um, he also could cup his hand and make a sound like a, a voice. And at these concerts that they had at night, um, so Paget would, would cup his hands and make a voice sound. And he went on to produce the first artificial larynx. And we also had Paderewski here, who had a risky here, who was quite um, famous at the time. As I said, he was supposed to have a concert in the Institute in Aberdour, <laughs> um, but it was too small, and so they had to have it in a field. And William Cuttle said that his mother had lent the piano for this concert. Um, they had these concerts with the top singers and theatre producers and violinists who were all working on the bass in Aberdour, where people could have top quality entertainment. Paderewski went on to become the Prime Minister of Poland and he signed the Treaty of Versailles. Now there's lots of pictures of ordinary things, ordinary things going on in Aberdour. Here's a tennis match outside Admiral uh, Beatty's house, Abadar House in Abadar, and you can see all the naval personnel there. The Abadar Sports Day, which was a big event, you can see naval hats all over the place. Women's Egg and Spoon Race. That's Sir Ryan giving a present prize to somebody. Um, when the war ended, um, they started to dismantle the base at the beginning of 1919. Obviously, the war ended in October 1918. And um, a Mr. Trello came to close the base. Um, he was a chief gunner in the Royal Navy. And it, his son contacted me with um, various papers about closing base down. So that was it. Everybody had left in 1919. Uh, still cables and the odd porpoise hydrophone left behind. And um, there's Mr. Trello with his son at Silver Sands in Abadar and at the, the Western Beach too. Um, they blew up the mines at the end of the war in 1919. That's outside boxcar um, lighthouse. So if we look back to the successful scientific achievements at HMS Tarlea, we've got, obviously got the hydrophone, which um, was able to pick up a U-boat at, at 12 miles. <laughs> away um, and they were able to detect the difference between um, a U-boat and an ordinary, um, the engine of an ordinary battleship. Sona went on to be able to detect exactly where the enemy U-boat was but at the time using hydrophones they got a precise um, reading of where the boat was and I gave a, a talk at Resyth Dockyard and they said that hydrophones are still used today because unlike sonar they're undetectable if they're being used so uh, well done Sir I <laughs> and the, the crew at uh, and the scientists at HMS Tarlea. They saved hundreds of lives and were responsible for sinking many U-boats and other enemy uh, ships. So um, a, a huge success in the war effort. Uh, they also they proved here that um, the velocity of sound was four and a half times um, uh, 
was approximately four and a half times um, faster than um, air. And they had produced the micro, the magnifying mine, and the depth sounding bomb. They proved sea boats were um, useful in detecting submarines. Seaplanes were useful in detecting submarines. They had um, they set up the hydrophone stations around the coast of Britain and in the Mediterranean. They produced the first remote control boats, the first remote control torpedoes, the first remote control toys. The science uh, to perfect the photophone, which had originally been designed by Alexander Bell, um, had been perfected here and went on to produce the first talking movies. And they carried out experiments to produce, to prove that indicator loops um, were able to detect U-boats and every British harbour was fitted with these in World War II. At the end of the war, Viscount Jericho had, um, had written that they were greatly indebted to Captain Ryan's valuable work carried out at Hawk Creek. Many brilliant ideas were due to his, Captain Ryan's, clever brain. And this is the end of the talk, just in case you were wondering where Aberdare was. I'm sure you've probably all been there, hopefully. And that is my email address if you've got any questions. Um, so that's the end, <laughs> I think. Okay, thank, thank you, Diana. <laughs> So we'll just leave that up for a for a little while, um, so if someone anybody could take a note of it. Mm -hmm. They want to contact you because you know they maybe come up with a question yeah. afterwards. That if they're anything like me, it's only afterwards I think, oh, I could have said such and such, could have asked such and such. So, mm -hmm. um, but there is a question in already. Um, where did they do their training to learn to use this new technology? It, it was all done here at. Um, at HMS Talia. And they and the people who weren't trained here were trained by trainers who had been here. If you see what I mean. So all yes. the training was done here or done by people who had been trained here. But four right. men went through here learning how to use it. So a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Busy place. Mm -hmm. So we'll just we'll just uh, give a minute or two for, um, for maybe others to you know, to post a, a question. But um, I I um, I've been to Aberdeer lots of times and had no idea at all um, that such a thing um, you know had existed and indeed the remnants still around. Um, I always find that quite interesting. Is the fact that. If, if you if you yourself were, were brought up there and and, and didn't you know didn't yes, know it was. yeah uh, and we did we knew nothing about it even um pauline norman who bought the um the hotel the fourth view hotel where they've got room in, with a view now she knew nothing about it you know what went on in her house and and in the the seaplane base nothing about it at all and also um, there's a chap, Simon Taylor, who's a doctor of history, who I was at school with from Aberdeer, and he knew nothing about it either. We, we just didn't know. It was only when um, the, this, the, when they were released from the Rossa dark, dockyard about the mid-90s mid that I picked it up when um, the experiments had been released. And then I was able to get a copy of um, of Albert Wood's memoirs and experiments and, and put them both together. Okay, and um, is the is the book still in in publication, Diana? Yes, yes. Um, if anybody was interested and wanted the book, they're on 
Amazon, but if anybody was coming down to Abadar, let let me know, and uh, because they're a wee bit more expensive on Amazon, and we can we, we sell them at tops for five pounds, but obviously by the time we've sent it and packed it up and everything, you know, it adds up. But if anybody was coming to Abadar, we would be happy if you could contact me. We'll let you have some books. Do you want one? So another couple of questions here, and the first one is, was there a Navy residential site in Aberdeen for the sailors to live? Well, some of them took over houses in Aberdeen, um, and a lot of them slept at um, the Fourth View Hotel. There's a, a, a story in the memoirs, the book from that I got from the book Hush. Um, of climbing over bodies in the middle of the night, not dead bodies, but sleeping bodies. Um, so yes, they were they were just put up um, in Aberdour. They were obviously all weren't trained at the same time, so they would have had a system, and they would be put up in the institute in Aberdour with hammocks and everything. They would the more the singers that came to work here long term. Um, they they were renting flat, flats in the village, but uh, several of them actually owned my house, which you know because I looked at the title deeds, so so they didn't you know occupy my house, but it was just a bit of by chance that he was here, I suppose. Bought it. I, I imagine some were billeted in in uh, people's houses, were they? Yes, yes. Uh, I would think Hot Creek House, although um, the, the house next to me that used to be a, a B and B would have had um, a whole lot of uh, of um, naval personnel bulleted there as well. Mm -hmm. And another question. There's a lots, lots of good questions here. Um, all the photos showed men. Were there any women involved in the project at, at any time? I, I didn't come across any women, apart from uh, Cyril Ryan's uh, housekeeper that read the tea leaves. <laughs> so, what 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 is there left to see on the on the ground, uh, and how 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 easy is it to to find or to spot? Would you well, say? Well, we've got a notice board, and the notice board is positioned at the at Hawk Creek Point. Um, in such a way that it shows you how it would have been then. Just now there's the remains of the harbour and there's just concrete bases of where the huts had been. When I was um, young, uh, one of the huts was still there and used by a local fisherman, Bob May. Uh, sadly, it's gone now when he went, but I do remember that. But it's, it's fairly fairly obvious that these bases are still still obvious, are they? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. that's, but that's uh, all, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, but now that um, we're, we're coming out of the, the COVID situation, you know, and people are freer to move around, um, that's certainly a, a destination to, to check out. Because I say, I've been to Aberdeer, I don't know how many times, mm -hmm. and just had, had, had no idea that... Uh, um, that that was there, and I suppose moreover that um, so many different things came out of all that experimentation. Yes, yes. I mean, valuable things. Laser beams and everything, you know, the projected light beam, all that uh, follow-on technology, sonar. Hmm. And I mean, some of the some of the names you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. I, I did recognise. Um, Darwin and Guy Geiger, mm -hmm. and right, yeah. Professor Rutherford was 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 well known. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, that was the name. That was the, the name that I mainly recognised. Mm -hmm. um, he was the director of research here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing to think that there was all these um, people in, involved, and you know, high mm -hmm. high profile people. Yes. Um. Another question, Diana, where, where did you source your photographs? Um, that was the um, 
Maritime Museum in London and some somebody contacted me with some after an articles after articles had been written in the village news. It was a Mr. Stevens, no longer with us anymore, but they were his personal photographs too. So very, very lucky to have all these pictures because mm. it brings it to life more than somebody just telling you what went on. Oh, very much so. I mean, I, I was quite surprised actually to the, um, the amount of photographs that, that there were, especially by the fact that it was, it was all kind of secret. You know, yeah. I was kind of surprised that there was so many photographs <laughs> uh, and, and showing the actual um, devices as well. Yeah. It was a bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any more material to emerge or are you fairly well, sure? Well, I'm quite interested with the um, indicator loops because, you know, I hadn't, that was when I had just done the, the first edition. Some things dribble in, but nothing of huge importance. Just somebody saying that, oh, um, my grandfather worked there and... Um, and somebody contacted me to say that their father had worked there and had a whole box full of hydrophones. I was getting so excited because I haven't got one. And unfortunately, when they cleared his house, they had thrown them out. Oh, dear. So, yeah. You know, nothing of huge importance, but it would be lovely if somebody turned up with a hydrophone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one from that era. Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> have, have, did any find their way to, you know, the museum in Edinburgh, for example? Or? No, not that I've been able to discover. Right. Well, that's a shame then that... Uh, <laughs> of course, they've got the modern ones now, which are very similar um, design and everything, but it would have been nice to have one of the old original ones. So uh, 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 this is a comment more than a question, and it's absolutely correct. And I think we're all kind of guilty of not doing this. And that is that um, how important it is to record the names of people in photographs, because you just you, you never know in the future and what interest people will have, especially when yeah. it maybe more so when it's of historical, um, yeah. you know, uh, 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 a historical scenario, um, mm -hmm. not just. I mean, our everyday photographs, we tend not to not to name them. And, you know, in, in maybe 50 years' time, people will be looking and saying, who on earth is that? But it's yes. more important um, for the historical ones. But um, the fact that so many, uh, they managed to source so many has been mm -hmm. fantastic. Yes, it was, it was good. <laughs> so there's no, no immediate thoughts of a, of a, of a third edition then? Um, I don't think I've got enough enough uh, for a third edition yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I'd just like to thank you very much, Diana, for that, that comprehensive uh, talk. One, as I say, something that I certainly knew nothing about, didn't even know it existed. Um, there is a website, isn't there? The uh, is it on the, is it on the cultural association? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so folk could check that out if they wanted to find out a little bit more. Or as I say, now that we're allowed to travel around a bit more, um, maybe actually visit if, when the sun deigns to come out to come out again. We know we're not getting hail and and mm -hmm. all sorts like that. Um, so yes, to thank thank you very much. Um, that was actually our um, penultimate uh, talk of the season um, and our next talk is entitled Railways Before Railways. That will be the last talk for this uh, season but of course um, we're working on, on, on next season's programme. But if there's no other uh, questions I'll just end the, the broadcast here um, and just say thank you very much again Diana and um, I'll, I'll catch you in the studio I'll just end the broadcast mm -hmm. now. Good night everyone, thank Bye. you.